You know, an episode of any series can be banned for any myriad of reasons, whether content or language, or back in the day where some of the southern uh, places in the States didn't want to look at, for example, a white, a white guy like William Shatter kissing a black woman like Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek. But this episode was the only original episode pulled from syndication, mostly because of his racial overtones. It was withheld uh, from the TZ syndication package until 2016. So, for example, in Detroit, they used to show the syndication package. Uh, we, we didn't get it. And I only saw the episode just a few years ago, and I know Neville Brand and, and George uh, Takai or Takei had a very good performance. In this one, a Japanese laborer and a, uh, uh, a veteran of the Second World War, mostly the Japanese campaign, have an encounter. It's called the encounter. According to a Searling, uh, two men alone in the attic, a young Japanese-American, a seasoned veteran of yesterday's war. It's 20-odd years since Pearl Harbor, but two ancient opponents are moving into position for a battle in an attic crammed with skeletons, souvenirs, mementos, old uniforms, and rusted medals. Goals from the dim reaches of the past that will lead us into the Twilight Zone. Now, digging through his attic and he's cleaning it up, an American World War II veteran named Fenton finds an old katana. A young Japanese-American named Arthur Takamori comes to look for in for work on a tip for a neighbor. Fenton is gruff yet cordial and invites Takamori to share a beer with him in his cluttered attic. Fenton makes a remark about the incongruity between his first name and his obvious ethnicity. Arthur takes offense at first, but when it becomes apparent that Fenton meant no harm, he admits he changed his name from Taro. Fenton shows Takamori the sword and says he took it off a Japanese soldier whom he killed during the war 20 years ago. When Fenton leaves to fetch more beer, Takamori takes hold of the sword and says to himself in a astonishing way, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Why? We believe the sword is crying out for justice, which makes a lot more sense than what happens next. Fenton says he is reportedly trying to sell, give away, or throw out the sword, but it always comes back. He has had the inscription on translated, The sword will avenge me. Seemingly despite himself, Fenton sometimes speaks in a racially offensive uh, manner, such as addressing Takamori as boy, but he often apologizes for it and says he was just kidding around. Still, Takamori grows more uneasy and more confrontational to match Fenton's increasing hostility. They have brief heated exchanges that cool but then reemerge. While recounting how he got the sword, Fenton appears to suffer a post-traumatic flashback. They assume an adversarial posture, and Takamori challenges Fenton with the sword. This tension too subsides, though Takamori, seeming to gain some kind of supernatural insight from the sword, says Fenton killed a Japanese soldier after the soldier surrendered. Fenton challenges the accusation, but then admits to do it while saying he was acting under orders to take no prisoners. Intensely uneasy now, Takamori tries to leave, but the door to the ankle won't open for either him or Fenton, even though it doesn't have a lock. In response to an insult from Fenton, Takamori describes the experience as a small child in Pearl Harbor. His father was a construction foreman who helped build a harbor. Takamori watched as the planes bombed the harbor, and his father with it. He first states his father tried to alert soldiers to the attack, but then confesses that his father was actually a traitor who directed where the plane should drop the bombs. And uh, nothing of this occurred in, uh, in real life. It was more speculation. Seeing Takamori's guilt, Fenton tries to offer some comfort. The sword, however, appears to be dictating the course of the conversation, and soon Takamori accuses Fenton of being a murderer because he killed an un uh, unarmed man. Fenton defends himself by saying his orders were to take no prisoners. In a sudden depression, Fenton admits that he's unhappy with himself and what he has done. He has lost his job, his wife is leaving him, and he's consumed with hostility and bigotry, and he coaxes Takamori into conversation because he does not want to be left alone. Of course, he's criticizing a whole bunch of ethnic groups more than the Japanese. But Takamori, now thoroughly under uh, controlling influence of the sword, poises to kill Fenton. Fenton sees him by the sword arm and overpowers him, and the samurai sword is dropped, wedging into table supports pointing upward. Going down to the floor to retrieve it, Fenton is then fatally impaled on a sword, but Takamori pulls at his feet. Takamori takes the sword, shrieks Banzai, and jumps out the attic window, presumably to a suicidal death. Moments later, the first floor door slowly opens on its own. Two men in an attic, locked in mortal embrace. Their common bond and their common enemy, guilt. A disease all too prevalent amongst men both in and out of the Twilight Zone. 
this is a very, very uh, strong episode in ways that maybe weren't going to be talked about in 1964 or 63 CBS. This comes. This could be easily a stage play. But George Takei or George Takei, whatever you want to call him, is tremendous in this episode, and so is uh, Neville Brand. Neville Brand has always been known to be uh, a villainous uh, character, but his uh, performance in this, he draws a lot of empathy and sympathy. You know, he was a war veteran, and he was a leading man again for a lot of uh, movies uh, back in the day. Now, he is best known for playing Al Capone on the TV series The Untouchables, and his pilot in the open scene in the premiere, and a double episode of The Big Train. Now, when uh, when George Akai was first starting here as an actor, this is probably when he, he's more in, uh, in uh, important in the roles. Now, at the time, I think he was 27 or 28, uh, he was basically still learning his trade, and uh, he became a strong character actor besides uh, Star Trek. But ironically, ladies and gentlemen, he was doing mostly English voiceover for some uh, Japanese movie, and uh, the filmography was was uh, quite strong as well. But the TV, before he did Twilight Zone, he did uh, four episodes of Hawaii and I, one episode of Assignment Underwater, and one episode of uh, uh, Perry Mason, which he got his, uh, kind of his big start. And uh, the films, of course, Godzilla Raids Again, Held to Eternity, uh, PT-109, uh, PT where he played a helmsman, he played Kato in Red Line 7000, and uh, also the Green Berets. But like I said, uh, Sulu on Star Trek, he was doing enough episodic television. I think uh, Roddenberry uh, decided to use him because he was a very intelligent and very strong uh, uh, actor. And uh, what was uh, interesting about this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he was... Uh, he was very strong in episodic television well into uh, the, uh, the, the 90s into the 2000s. He's always been a strong character actor. So you get a great, a great actor like Neville Brand, a great actor like George Takai, and what they're presenting, ladies and gentlemen, it's obviously supernatural. But can a sword hold the memory of negativity? Well, like I said, it's, uh, it is science fiction. But uh, Rod Serling didn't, didn't write this episode. It was... Um, uh, Martin M. Goldsmith, uh, which, uh, ironically, he was an Academy Award nominee for something called uh, Narrow Margin. He, uh, he's a one-time brother-in-law of Anthony Quinn, so the talent runs in the family. And Narrow Margin, again, he earned an Academy Award nomination. Uh, and he was a novelist as well, as well. He did the movie Detour, which was based on his movie, uh, book of the same name, uh, Blind Spot. Uh, and... Um, Pretty, pretty much he's acting, uh, excuse me, he's writing uh, uh, kind of wrapped up with, uh, with Twilight Zone. But like I said, a very, very important uh, writer for his era. A lot of Bowie B movies, but, uh, you know, and of course uh, he, um, uh, he, uh, he basically wrote something that people should have respected a lot more, but I don't see basically Rod Serling writing something like this. Because his expertise wasn't towards, uh, you know, uh, uh, the racism towards people from Hawaii or Japan that uh, lived in the, the States during the uh, the unfortunate uh, internment. You know, he had his own issues, but like I said, uh, Rod Serling picked a good person to write it, two good actors to present it, and The Encounter is probably one of the most underrated TZ, TZ episodes of all the series. It's a, quite a good episode. So if you have a chance, give it a look and let me know what you know. Let me let me know what you think. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's our latest Twilight Zone uh, review. If you like what we're doing here, give us a like, comment, subscribe, or share. We appreciate it. Everybody that drops in. But like I said, on City TV in Canada, they have all five seasons available through Amazon Prime. So check them out. Uh, no commercials, of course. Well, a few, but unlike City. Have a good one.